before I begin, I must say that I've aimed to craft this talk, this lecture, in the most generic of terms due to the constraints of space and time and the nature of my present aim, which will be explicitly theoretical. By this, I mean to suggest that I'll offer no rebuttal to Peterson's thinking, no sweeping critique, and no singular objection. Deleuze tells us that objections are of no use and never move us forward, that the principle of charity demands that we begin in concession. In contradistinction to revolution, I will offer heresy, an inversion from within, an ironic embrace, which is in truth something like Bruno's grace of Caesar. I will take on Peterson's thinking such that we might find a way in, taking his thinking as our subject matter or object of inquiry, as a generative tabula rasa for our own further thinking, which might call it into question. That tyrant called time will permit me only to briefly suggest avenues for future inquiry, and I'll thus intend to say what must be said in the simplest of terms, such that ease of use is set above a certain axiological rigor. Although I've said that all replies should begin in concession, I'm afraid that I must be begin with a concern about the prospects of the endeavor in which we're presently engaged. In entering into this discourse, I find myself already vexed vis-a-vis -vis its prospects. The devotion of time to a subject, the expending of energy in relation to a given object of inquiry, provokes the specter of legitimation, and we must not brush the specter too quickly aside. This is, of course, one of the Searle's realizations of his phenomenology. In speaking of, we point at, and we say inadvertently, here is something. The cacophony and commotion of any democracy attests to the fact that to legitimate is to grant voice, to set out a platform. And I will avoid very intentionally speaking against this democracy. Indeed, the democracy of thinking, a generic thinking, which is a democracy of thinking in which all thinking is set equal to all other thinking without regard to qualities, whatever it may be, is too often at odds with the philosophical, the hegemony of the institution beholden to the academy. A democracy of thought is not a level playing field, so to speak. It never sets all thoughts equal in regard to worthiness, but merely in regard to their equality as thoughts, in whatever manner they are. This democracy permits us still to be careful as we undertake the granting of voice, and permits us to be aware of the way in which we grant it. We've come together to call the thinking of Jordan Peterson into question, to critique the basis of thought, theoretic, philosophical, and ideological terms, and in terms of its praxis generativity or lack thereof. Insofar as we critique, and especially insofar as we shield our critique from academic obscurantism, as we ought to, and we must balance the Sartrean impulse of the engaged intellectual with a Gnostic disavowal of the world as such, we also lend our ears. The critical project is always a legitimating project. We give to Peterson a platform, we attend to his thinking, and we follow it. There's a democracy in this and an openness, but there's also a risk. We take a gamble and cross a Rubicon of legitimacy, and like Caesar, we must declare that a die has been cast. There are other methods of approach or pathways upon which we might prefer to venture. We might close our eyes and ignore. Rather than intervening in lieu of debate, we might brand Peterson a pseudo-intellectual, and thereby in that institutional declaration, lock up the veritable gates of our ivory tower. Secure from Peterson and his ilk, we might leave the plebeians down below to decide for themselves whether to embrace this outcast or rather to knock upon the gates of our tower, humbling themselves for our gracious admittance. We know, however, that such a maneuver would only serve to bolster Peterson against the academy, and so we've come together. We've left behind the old traditionalism of the classroom, the institution, and made of ourselves a new guard or a para-academia, and we've stooped. This is the price of our intervention, so let it not be forgotten that in our coming together, Peterson and his thinking have already been legitimated. Herein lies our beginning in concession or abnegation. We've called his thinking important enough to garner scrutiny, vital and popular enough to demand reply, and dangerous enough for the severity of our concern. Prior to issuing a full reply, and before our concern can be sufficiently registered, a cartography must take place. Peterson must be located schematically all thinking is in some sense contextual in as much as it's given its vivacity by its locale. And those styles of thinking which surround it and impose it frequently, which are alterities to it, are exteriorities with which this thinking comes into contact, producing novelty in a non-repetitive event, novelty which is not merely representative of the same singular positionality. 
The question that must be posed is this. What sort of thinking is Peterson doing? What is the context in which his thought can be located? What is the root of his theoretic output? We must first undertake the construction of a theoretic map which is not merely the geometry of a tired canon, but which illustrates that no thought is entirely original or structured non-causally. This is not a map qua totality, but a map which is a tool in the same sense as it would be for any geographer, which is a particular attunement in that sense. This map is not the world, but a representation engendered by the non-represented subject. This is a map as a representation with all of the faults intrinsic to such things. The question then is where on this map we find Peterson or what is the locus of his thinking? There's an objection that we may encounter here, although I want to follow Deleuze and suggest that objections might not be of much use to us. So we'll call it a complication and proceed accordingly. It's this, Peterson can be found in our schema. He stands outside of our geography opposed to the canon without forbear or precedent. This mythic outsiderness lends power to any critique, but it is an undue power. It's the same myth that the populist has employed throughout the ages, and in that fact is, of course, its very precedence. One cannot be an outsider if one proclaims such a position. To be such an outsider is, ipso facto, to not be. To call oneself an outsider is to follow the well-trodden path of all of those other outsiders who came before and thus, of course, to be Insider. Peterson is subject to our geography, not despite this complication, but because of it. The first thing that we must note about Peterson's thinking is that it's worthy of our theoretic consideration precisely insofar as it critiques the philosophical experience as it's been traditionally construed. Anti-philosophy is always of philosophical interest. Indeed, the critique of philosophy or often risable proclamation of the end of philosophy may be at the core of the theoretic. All critiques of philosophy seem in another light to merely be critiques of incipient theorizing. Peterson's anti-philosophy, his philosophic kernel, lies upon a foundation of disinterest. For Peterson, the philosophy of the academy is that discipline which seeks the true, and the good, and the beautiful, only to its own detriment. Kant and Hegel, Foucault and Fichte, Schelling and Badiou have, in Peterson's view, very little of interest to say. And even in their saying, words essentially turn to dust. Academic philosophy is largely irrelevant, stale, underinformed by the social and natural sciences, and overly, overtly dependent on the value of certain, and by certain I mean white, male, bourgeois, proper names. It would be disadvantageous, practically and theoretically, to think of this critique as unusual, and our blindness to such concerns equates, often, to the locking up of the gates of the ivory tower, which we've already chosen to set aside in our act of assembly. Insofar as this is the case, as heresy is the path we take, and I submit that it's the only theoretically viable path, we would be wise to heed Peterson's critique of philosophy. It takes little force of will to imagine an undergraduate, frustrated with the respect and homage paid to the dead white men of the philosophical canon, an undergraduate who declares in a huff that thinking about thinking is an utter waste of time, a useless activity proffered and peddled by eggheads with little else to do. In our coming together today, we've already capitulated, in a way, and agreed that praxises do a certain place as the core of theory itself, rather than in opposition or dialectical opposition to it. We've not said abstraction and dialectical opposition to mediation, but rather abstracted from this abstraction, such that our abstract heresy is without abstraction, per se. We've taken this heresy, which is abstract without abstraction, as our axiomatic thesis, from which our current endeavor proceeds in a theorematic fashion. In this way, we are with the undergraduate Peterson today, although we must, of course, kill the Oedipal father. This is evidenced in our refusal to lock up the gates of the academy and myopically immerse ourselves in our tones and our scholarship. Ambiguity is so often taken from mysticism or poetry, theology or ontological hand-waving. Rigor and logical consistency then seem to stand in opposition to complexity, to the challenging prose in a dual subspecie aeternitatis, a dialectic without abrogation, which is manifested in the present divisions between analytic and continental philosophies. Clarity of thought and word tend to emerge not only as a virtue, but as the one and only virtue. We can offer an aphorism by which this emergent school of clarity, this ecumenical Catholicism of lucidity, lives and breathes. Good thinking is above all clear thinking. 
Peterson's anti-philosophy takes as its fundamental presumption that much of traditional philosophy betrothed to the institution fails to live for this aphorism. What is Anglo-American analytic philosophy, but Peterson's anti-philosophy become philosophical? Did not Wittgenstein and Russell, Frege and Dewey beat Peterson to the proverbial punch? These concerns, though, are never unusual. Not inventive critiques of recent date, and as state or plain as they may be, are worthy of our attention. The critique which tends to demarcate analytic philosophy from continental philosophy, the critique of the undergraduate major, lies at the heart of Peterson's recent book, 12 Rules for Life. Whether this particular demarcation is of any value or validity is a topic for another time, but we must simply note that Peterson is, to his own chagrin perhaps, certainly doing philosophy. His anti-philosophical stance, which eschews complexity, amphibia, and metadiscursivity, is a philosophical, even metaphilosophical, stance. There's no philosopher who does not call philosophy to account for itself. And we can constitute philosophy, as we always do, under a doctrinal aspect. Peterson's presumptive anti-philosophy, his anti-philosophical presupposition, is not only philosophy, but philosophy par excellence. The Petersonian methodology consists in issuing simple, rationalistic proclamations given by some post-decisional logos, proclamations about the way in which we ought to behave, which are rules grounded in always, in always secondary and associated naturalistic rationale. This methodological approach allows for an unambiguous locating in our ideal geography. Like the frustrated undergraduate biology major and the analytic ordinary language philosopher, Peterson presupposes as what is apparent to him as suppositional, as merely positional, even though it's actually auto-positional, that practicality, frankness, clarity, and common sense are more valuable than the theoretic pontificating of which the philosophy of proper names has so often been accused. For Peterson, praxis generativity is not only the kernel of theory or vital center of theory, but is prior to and constitutive of what it means to theorize at all. One theorizes necessarily from positionality in media and race, a position which is rooted in and generative of praxis. Anything else in this view is spiritualistic neo-Hegelian babble. The influence of and similarity with Anglo-American pragmatism is paramount. Thinking is valuable only insofar as it adds something of value. In this account, the problematic feature of Marxism is its impracticality. It leads to negative consequences, which is to say less positive praxis generativity or less praxis generativity. We ignore leotard in the postmodern dismissal of metanarratives because qua theory, it generates no obvious praxis. It displays no capacity for praxis generativity or no evident capacity for that. We ignore Hegel because his prose is unreadable. It's too challenging to allow for the generation of lots of very beneficial praxis. In a word, it's useless. It's here that I think we must consider an admittedly heterodox alliance between Peterson and another philosopher who, perhaps reactionarily, in regard to the return to the ontological question, declared the end of philosophy as such, Heidegger. Peterson might reject such a locating in the same theoretic camp as a philosopher who so often been accused of obfuscation, but that aside, or precisely because of that, it seems necessary to me to consider such an alliance, such a like locating, and I use the locution camp here in a signifying manner. Let's recapitulate some of Peterson's critique of the philosophical enterprise as traditionally construed. First, Peterson sees philosophy as an obscure, inaccessible discipline, which is out of touch with the real, perhaps when it's not naivete or in its privileging of transcendence over imminence. He's right about this in a way, in his view, the necessity of a doctorate for the grasping of a concept equates to that concept's irrelevance. The hegemony of the conceptual attunement is the only attunement of the king of fools, leads to the ego-driven locking up of the ivory tower. Second, the philosophy of the academy, as of late, rejects traditional values or tends to repudiating the centrality of these values. The family, church, religion, etc., are not taken seriously in much of institutionalized philosophy. Postmodernism has won out, and Aquinas is read as more as an example of what to avoid than what to strive for. Scholasticism is a bad joke, and the question of the number of angels on the head of a pin is not only not seriously considered, but seriously unconsidered. Peterson does not want us to renounce or, more strongly, scornfully abandon and sardonically jettison traditional values, at least not totally. He doesn't want to give in to the postmodern dismissal of meta narratives and the revaluing of all values, which he like Heidegger, sees as the beginning of a pervasive and corrosive nihilism. 
The rejection of meta narratives is problematic in Peterson's view because they are at work for us or pragmatically good. They grant us comfort or ground, they're critical in their non criticality. And their reification of modernity contra the postmodern or post human, non anthropocentric, ecocentric impulse. There's a reason, after all, that Peterson's book is subtitled An Antidote to Chaos. The repudiation of meta narratives is a rejection of what Peterson thinks makes us most human or humane as distinct from the world, which grants us the most meaning. The third element of Peterson's critique, the third aspect under which we can constitute it, is the notion that postmodern philosophy, which is the child of the philosophy of proper names, its dark progeny, doesn't work for us. It doesn't merely contradict our practical wisdom, but dares to call it into question. It dares to condemn our dismissal of meta-narratives to a processual act of self-accounting and grants thinking about thinking priority vis-a-vis -vis lived experience an experience sense of mediation, which is perhaps the anti-phenomenological noema of life itself. We can hear Emerson or Thoreau here, that which is the truest or realist, and I don't mean this onto theologically, is that which works best for me or at work. We learn and grow by living our truth, not by contemplating. Peterson's thinking takes on a sense as one element in the schematic lineage of the pseudo-naturalistic neopragmatism. For Heidegger, the beginning of Greek rationalism, the urge of and to the rational, that model of rational personhood in Socrates and Plato is not the only the beginning of philosophy, is not the beginning of philosophizing proper, but an untimely end to the important work of ontology. In his view, the Socratic project and its repetitional growth in Plato and Aristotle initiates a slow descent from the pre-Socratics who so carefully guarded the question of being. From Greece onwards, this question has been increasingly supplanted and abrogated by the questions of being qua being something, that which makes up being, being positive as X, etc. Peterson shares the contention that the most central question has been decentralized, placed on the postulatory back burner as naive, speculative, or otherwise of some lesser order of importance. Peterson's foes are largely the philosophers of the postmodern condition rather than the Socratic project, but the return to the question that matters most is here a shared gestalt. I'm going to skip over for now the rest of the uh, analysis of Heidegger, but it's worth returning to later. So there are three ways in which we might proceed, three procedures we might employ so as to answer the anti-philosophical contentions of Heidegger and Peterson. First, we might simply dismiss these contentions as they are, turning the other cheek, and claim as our little rebellion that such anti-philosophical contentions are petty or polemical. We might declare them pseudo-philosophical, non-academic, inscrutable, or opaque, and therefore seek their delegitimation. This delegitimation of the anti-philosophical critique is, of course, internal to the academy. Outside of the academy's walls, no matter their strength or their seemingly durable capacity for impermeability in regard to the other, the anti-philosopher is never a villain but a hero, we might consider Lacan here. At the very least, the anti-philosopher commands the walks populi in a way that the philosopher does not cannot. The delegitimation of Peterson's critique within the academy entails a re-legitimation outside of the academy, not despite, but precisely due to that delegitimation. This re-legitimation is a rebellion against the perceived pompousness of the ivory tower, and the thing about a tower is that there are always more people on the ground outside of it than within its walls. The second way in which we might seek to answer the Petersonian critique is to defend philosophy and take up theoretic arms in its defense, in a defense of the canon and its proper names. I will say frankly that this is not a project I wish to undertake. I share the concern that philosophy qua philosophy has been out of touch with the real insofar as it posits it as X and with the reality of being in the world. In focusing more on being as such than being something in particular, caring more for an ontology than that which lives, breathes, eats, can suffer, and feel the odious horror of war and famine, Philosophy has subsumed the person, no matter what, under the auspices of scholarship with no relevance outside of the academy and no want for such relevance. Levinas tells us that Heidegger's Dasein is never hungry. Philosophy posits the person is never hungry. Levinas tells us that the need for the other persists. The philosophy beholden to the institution has no need nor want for genuine alterity. The theoretic begins in and with textuality in the engagement with the text and analyzes and interprets and moves with or out of that which has been written. I'm afraid that I may be a bit Talmudic here, but it seems to me that the theoretic begins and must begin in media race, in the middle of the text or the act of decoding. 
the theoretic qua theoretic, it can't end there if it is truly to be itself sans philosophy as we've critiqued it. It can't conclude in the decoding of the source, nor can it culminate in the passage to the act of recoding. Whether this novel text is a symptom of some compulsion to repeat, some preordained concrescence, a reshuffling of antique cards, or something genuinely new. Theory must enter a realm of praxis generativity as the centered but centrifugal driver of its processual nature. We might say that first philosophy equals last philosophy. The last principles and the person as the person in the last principle is set as or as greater than the first principle. Theory thus escapes the hermeneutic deductive dialectic of ontology. The ethical insofar as it's the realm in which theory praxifies itself is the topological site of last philosophy. Pre-politically, every thinking acts a generosity. The only question is whether the thinking become philosophical acknowledges its transmutation into a secondary autopositionality, which is merely foundational rather than auto-foundational. The question at hand vis-a-vis -vis the philosophical is always to what extent recollection of the ethical has taken place, of the total insufficiency, the total finitude, recast as an infinity, of the non-qualitative person in the last instance, person no matter what. The canon of the philosophy of proper names is relevant secondarily, but it doesn't matter so much that theory becomes philosophical, ends in a compulsion to re-encode with another book or pamphlet, and so on. Peterson would have us dismiss the metaphysical or ontological and begin in with the ethical, or perhaps the political, and thus that which is often subsumptive of the ethical and genuine alterity, insofar as it's normativizing in its presumed relationality. We must begin, for Peterson, in and with the rule which has a distinguished history of functively working well in this regard. But there's a third way, which we might seek to answer Peterson's critique, the method of heresy, a method of taking Peterson's thought as our subject matter and proceeding via a first abnegation. Towards the latter half of 1939, a young Emmanuel Levinas was deployed as a soldier in the French army in the fight against the approaching Nazis. He was dispatched to the front and less than a year later was captured and imprisoned. While there, he noticed that none of the guards would so much as acknowledge the existence of the imprisoned officers. The only being who acknowledged the prisoners was a dog, which he quipped was the last Kantian in all of Germany. The last German to care for the categorical imperative, which is a stunning rebuttal, even if anecdotal, of the whole history of Kantianism, which I submit, in its god qua limit, reeks of bondage and slavery and is, at best, completely ineffectual. The inclination that all theory is by nature primarily originarily ethical, that we can't ignore the causal implications of theory from and at the ethical level without a disremembering, informs the entire, entirety of Levinas's voir after 1940. Levinas and Peterson share, in part, a cogent, persuasive critique of the philosophical enterprise, although this critique has perhaps become philosophical for Peterson in a way that I submit it does not need to. Thus far, we've agreed with Peterson and given over to him that philosophy is by nature rooted in a prior ethicality, that a philosophy which disremembers this is in some sense jejun. We've disagreed with Peterson insofar as we believe theory to originate necessarily in textuality, in engagement with proper names in the canon, with movement to the theoretic as movement out from the text. This is not a disagreement with which we can frame a heretic rebuttal, a death of the father. It's not wide enough ground for our counter-theoretic schema. I want to argue that a second and more crucial distinction can be made vis-a-vis -vis Peterson, which inverts Peterson's thinking in a generic act of subsumptive intellection, which puts Peterson in the same camp as the philosophical enterprise, which he so often critiques. This distinction surrounds the typographical, but also onto epistemological structurality of Peterson's supposedly non-philosophical thinking, the rule. The commandment is Peterson's presumptuous answer to our agreed upon critique of the philosophical a theory which is to take account of its originary locus in the ethical and its end qua last principle in the ethical space inhabited by the person no matter what. The structural integrity of the rule is always auto-positional and thus totalizing insofar as it posits itself as foundational but is never auto-foundational. This is why Levinas, whose thinking is grounded in the textuality of the Old Testament and Talmud, purposefully refuses the edict. The rule is a totalizing structure. The rule founds only a faux ethic, which in attending to the ethical as political is always an ethic of, and never a generic ethic. We might place Lacan or Badiou here. This is true of any framework which concerns itself principally with the demand as non-theoretically praxis-generative, 
And even a pragmatism which is aware of its ethicality must, insofar as it's a pragmatism, demand that the other qua other is compelled to be like me or unlike me, different by degree. Differentiation is always the positing of a mean and accords as difference with distance from this normativized center mark. If the other doesn't share the functi, the pragmatic framework, the same notion of use value, then they're ipso facto expelled, exiled, or executed. Alterity is subject to the count, becomes a difference of degree, or subject to expulsion. The other is placed either within the walls of the community, insofar as they share the communal vision, or expelled as opposed to the community and subsumed under oppositional categorization. The Levinasian non philosophy, which posits the ethical as constitutive of and primary to the philosophical, Ethics not only as first philosophy, but first philosophy in so far as its last philosophy, is critical not only of the philosophical, but also of Peterson's basically commandment centric, ontology dodging, systemic autopositionality. Unfortunately, constraints of space and mostly time don't allow us to sketch an alternative. To critique Peterson without providing such an alternative is not to intervene in lieu of debate, so much as to utter words without a trace. And given this, I will just say a few more constructive words to at least gesture. Possible construction. A non rule centric ethic, which retains its non philosophicality, must be predicated on an asymmetrical relation with the other, an abnegational position which is always already acted topologically. This is, of course, the essence of the Levinasian ethic, the ethic before the morality. The other, though, is for us conceived as the flesh and blood absolute, the rigorously human, which is auto foundational vis a vis the radically imminent real qua topology with Levinas, but imminent contra Levinas, inhabited by this absolute as the organon of deliverance from the philosophical, as well as by the self and the non-position of abnegation vis-a-vis -vis the other, which is a distance between the self and the other as infinite, in which the other consists in a finitude or radical insufficiency of the qualitative, recast thus against the qualitative as an infinity of alterity. This recasting is the effect of the non-qualitative quantum finitude set against this recast is infinitely other, but it is a person stripped of the qualitative, a person in the fashion of the no matter what, by a total lack of regard for any qualities. The person, no matter what, is thus allegiant to the as it is rather than the as such, as a modality of the person, a subject. It's always first a promise to itself, no matter what, and is other to all else because of this or in this promise's fashion. In this regard, the other is not even the other, not even the stranger, but in person, the person no matter what, without regard to the threshold of the count and without the qualitative and quantitative, which I submit with Bergson contraband you, is a subset of the qualitative. The other is never subject to the count, but is non-representational. It has no representationality to it. The subtraction of the qualitative into affinitude via the no matter what serves as an addition of an infinity of alterity in the same sense that an addition of the qualitative subtracts from the alterity of the other, from an infinity to affinity. This person, no matter what, is the axiomatically in person, the generic person who auto-founds our constructive alternative. The answer to Peterson's critique is not a rejection nor an acceptance totally, but a heretical stance, a stance of the last instance or a re-employment in the surface of generic ethic which is thus critical of Peterson's own rule-centric ethic, non-generic, faux ethics, or politics. In this way, we might take on the Petersonian and Heideggerian critique of the philosophy of proper names while renouncing the structurality of the commandment, its auto-positionality. We might instead turn to our generic humanity, a humanity with no regard to the count, but equality. In this way, our new guard might found a new ethic for a new time, which attends to the other, prioritizes the infinite alterity of the total and radical finitude of qualitative insufficiency, an ethic of hospitality, which is allied with the other, not because they're like or unlike me, different by degree, but because they are first a person, no matter what. Thank you. Thank you for speaking.